Warning, warning, Wii U, Wii U. If you're a big fan of Ruby and don't want to listen to people being rude about the show, you probably won't enjoy this podcast. Please don't make yourself suffer. You've been warned. Clean the living, sweep the floors, shut your mouth and do your chores, scrub the dishes in the sink. No one said that you should think. Shine the silver, wash your clothes, and when you're finished, dump the socks. Draw my bath, fetch my slippers, fill my glass, rub my feet, hurry up, you're so slow, you're no good. I hope you know that your life is of no use, and the truth is no one's ever loved you. The scene. Coco has once again run into Ruby by complete coincidence in a flashback. Ruby is worried that she's not meant to be the leader of Team Ruby, but Coco has some words to encourage her. Well, it seems completely random to me, Ruby said. Professor Ozpin told me something once, Coco said. When I asked him if I was supposed to be leading Team Coffee, she recalled his words as she repeated them for Ruby, a moment she would never forget. The world is chaotic. We try to assert order on it, try to make sense of it. We organize into four kingdoms, four schools, teams of four. But what if the only way to fight the chaos is to give in to it? All your planning, all your preparation can be undone if in a moment of bad luck, or a split second in which you make the wrong decision, or miss your mark, just so. Thus, I believe that we need to embrace randomness as well, try to harness it and turn it to our advantage. We have to play for the unexpected, prepare ourselves for situations we never could have anticipated or trained for. You and I are having this conversation because of a lifetime of choices, seemingly unrelated occurrences that nonetheless shaped who we are and led us here. The fact that two people met by chance and fell in love and had a daughter named Coco Adele is remarkable, don't you think? I do. Make no mistake, there is a higher power guiding our actions. Call it fate, call it destiny, call it the gods, or maybe it's simply the randomness of existence. Whatever it is, I have to trust that we are here for a reason, and while my methods might be unorthodox, they haven't failed me yet. <laughs> Ruby took a deep breath. Deep. She said, I feel like I should have written that down. <laughs> Hang on. So he's, he's suggesting that there is both a higher power guiding our actions, but it's possibly also just random chance. Yeah, maybe the higher power is random chance. You ever fucking think about that? Also, I like how part of it is just a rip off of that one speech from Watchmen. When Blue Man talks about the randomness of Silk Girl being born and stuff, it, it, it's that. Yeah. But, 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 it's, but it's my speech at my point now. <laughs> I don't understand how that reassures you whether or not you're supposed to be leader of a four-man groom-destroying team. <laughs> Look, like, it's well, deep. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, all sorts of stuff can happen for totally random reasons. It's, it's amazing you're here at all. You, so that's why you've got good leadership skills. I also like how it ends up being an excuse kind of retroactively for the fact that he has no plan. It's like, look, I mean, plans, you know, pff, anything can happen. What's even the fucking point of planning? I think we should just embrace randomness. <laughs> so just like, it's just this thing of these characters talking to the main characters from the actual show. It's so fucking Mary Sue-ish. <laughs> There's an entire s series of flashbacks where Yatsuhashi runs into Weiss uh, after Ruby, and then Coco talks to Ruby, and then Blake and Velvet run into each other, and then run into Yang, and it's just amazing stuff. <laughs> in, in like the Star Wars extended universe in those books, there was this one character, Karan Horn. It was he was a dude who he used to be a cool cop and then he and then he was an awesome X-wing pilot. Then it turned out he had talents in the force, so he he was just like this really Mary Sueish character from the first series of X-wing books. And then he got his own spin-off called I Jedi, where he had to go undercover. And at one point, <laughs> Luke Skywalker turns up and they team up. And at one point, he tells Luke Skywalker off and like he puts him in his place. And it's just it was so fucking <laughs> just. What if the other guy was here too and, my, and they were friends with my OC? Ugh. Doesn't that make you care way more about what's happening here? <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, you know what else is awesome? This episode. This oh, amazing yeah. episode. I love it. Hey guys, welcome to Ruby Slushy is Me Cube. Oh yeah, it's finished. You know what you're listening to. Anyway, I was thinking about how like this episode was made for us because on Anime Slushy, this podcast you're listening to, what are the two primary things we talk about? One, Ruby, sadly, and two post Madoka magical girl shows that go really hard on being dark and gritty and cruel. And like, mm -hmm. this episode is both. <laughs> it's amazing. It's got a magical girl and we see her dark and gritty backstory. <laughs> The entire world has bullied her. Yeah, so that's the thing. The entire first half or like first two thirds of this episode, we're finally getting Cinder's backstory. And it's amazing because we've talked so much about the idea of them only having limited storytelling time and such. Two thirds of this episode is spent on a backstory where the only relevant takeaway is, you know what the only relevant takeaway is? What? She's a victim! <laughs> That's literally all you need to know. I mean, we're going to talk in depth about everything that happens, but that's the only part of it that matters is that you need to know she's a victim. I mean, yeah, she is a victim, but I feel like a big part of the backstory is that she also did the wrong thing and, and should be punished. 
Oh, God. Uh, yeah, let's just fucking go. Let's do this shit. So Cinder, she cries. She's crying over her scrubby brushy as she's scrubbing the floor. And so she's on some sort of like evil orphan farm, I guess, in, at the very start of this. Yeah. The scrubbing, like, it, it is something she ends up doing in general in her childhood, but she's already suffering at the orphanage she's at. Like, it's already bad. Yeah, that's the thing where, like, obviously this flashback is going to have a lot of really on-the-nose parallels with Cinderella. But unlike Cinderella, she didn't go from a good situation to a bad situation. She has only ever had bad abusive situations. Yeah. yeah. So she's at the sorrow farm and other kids are bullying her, and she, but she fights back. And I guess that's to show you that someday maybe she's going to be someone who fights. Can you believe it? <laughs> and then we hear a voiceover thing that says, I'll take her. <laughs> <laughs> And it's her evil little stepmother. Ha <laughs> ha Get it? Mm. And now she's an Atlas. So I have to assume that place she was before was in Mistral because it has a lot of that kind of like China Japan aesthetic and <laughs> her clothes do too. Yes. Yeah. So for some reason, this wealthy Atlas hotel owner woman came to Mistral to get an orphan girl to be her a slave. Yes. Yes. For some that, reason. That, that's what's happened. She's gone to an orphanage to buy a child so they can be her indentured servant. No, but I think she adopted her because she's her guardian. So she didn't buy her. She adopted her. And it's like, oh, but she's secretly using her as slave labor. Okay, sure. But this is essentially the transaction that's happened. She now owns this person. Yeah, the same thing, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Let's not split hairs. She's bought a person. Wait, but speaking of hairs, oh, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> All the hair in this flashback is way better than most of the characters in the show. It looks like properly modeled anime hair, especially the evil bitch sisters. It, they have great hair, very on point. And I'm just like, why? I guess it's because they, they're models that they made later and they figured something better out and they couldn't go back and fix characters like Penny. <laughs> It's kind of funny that, yeah, like these characters who are only going to exist for this one flashback have better hair than Emerald, who we see in close up later on this episode. Like a nice close oh shot God. of her hair and her hair looks as bad as it always has. It kills me. On the concept art for this new outfit of hers, it's also one of those concept art sheets where there's a lot of options and they all look better than the final product. <laughs> but it specifically notes her head and says, you same head, don't need an update or something like that. And I was like, no. Nah! <laughs> What are you talking about? Anyway, Cinder. So, yeah, she's got an evil stepmother and two evil stepsisters. And, like, so Cinder turns up after this long trip and she's hungry and she sees a plate of food and it's like, food. Food? The mother takes a bread roll and throws it on the ground and then says, clean the floors, they're dirty. So, we, we, you know, we, we know what's going on here. She's, you know, in the abusive household setup of Cinderella. And we see her doing chores. But just to ram home... Just to ram home how bad her life is. We need something more. We need we need something else to really sort of push how much this sucks. What could we do, Cube? What, what could be done? Clean the linen, sweep the floors, <laughs> shut your mouth and do your chores. <laughs> we get a song. There's so much good about this because one, so the music that this is using is the song Sacrifice from volume two, which was a song that everybody always debated who the fuck it was about because it's clearly supposed to be Cinder's, like it, it's Cinder's leitmotif in the background music in the show, but the lyrics have never been clearly about Cinder because, you know, obviously it's one of those things where Jeff just wrote a headcanon for what the fuck Cinder's deal is. <laughs> yeah. But it's so much better because it's like the actual lyrics in, in Sacrifice are like, show them gods and deities, blind and keep the people on their knees, pierce the sky, escape your fate. The more that you try, the more you'll just breed hate and lies. Truth will rise, revealed by mirrored eyes. What if all the plans you made were not worth the price they paid? Even with the lives you stole, still no closer to your goal. So it's like, it seems like a very fuck you Oz pin. I won't be your sacrifice. Like maybe they have some kind of history. Mm. And so that's why she wants to take down the schools as she thinks this whole thing's corrupt. So having that replaced with her just with this song about how she has to do a lot of chores is just <laughs> mwah, <laughs> chef kiss, peak Ruby bullshit. I love it. It felt very like knockoff Disney to me in that sense. <laughs> like it, it's a song about what is happening on screen right now and how it sucks. Like Cinder should have been singing it as she was working. Like that's what it felt like. 
Yeah, and the thing is that this whole flashback series is a very weird mix of super edgy anime nonsense and Disney fairy tale shit, Mm. which ends up being very weird. Like her room that she has at this evil hotel is very Beauty and the Beast inspired. Like you look at the concept art and there's a big mirror with a sheet over half of it. There's a candelabra. There's all this stuff that's super on the nose. And it's like, that's not even your fairy tale. (laughs) But whoa, Disney fairy tales, Disney invented fairy tales tales remember but yeah the the song and it's great and it ends with and the truth is no one's ever loved you (laughs) (laughs) so she's yeah i I really didn't think we were going to get a second wooby character (laughs) this show wait okay well we also have to note that penny is very much a wooby character nowadays right so so we got another one now we're we're stacking them up so this is number three yeah i suppose yeah third child we've seen tortured in some way because it doesn't just stop at her being overworked and underfed because she has to like eat leftover food from people's plates and stuff like we see that happening no not in this 2020 world of edgy animes <laughs> no it has to go a bit further than that so when cinder does wrong when if she drops a plate or displeases her stepmother in some way her stepmother has a shock collar <laughs> it's amazing she has a shock collar with a remote i think it's a bit of yellow dust on it like a gem yeah, yeah, it's like electricity dust. Yeah, so she, whenever Cinder does wrong, she presses the button and Cinder gets electrocuted. It's so <sighs> funny. Like, part of me wonders if they just thought that they had shown too much, like, on-the-nose domestic abuse hitting someone around in the show. And so they were like, maybe we should do something a bit, like, more fantasy-ish or whatever. But t- t- this evil stepmom hitting the remote to electrocute her poor slave daughter is just so <laughs> It's too much. <laughs> It's just so silly and over the top. It was it's so unnecessary. Yeah. And it's going to become relevant to what happens at the end of this story. So <sighs> So what happens is Wait, I want to talk about the sisters before we talk about the hunter guy. Okay, sure, sure. Yeah. Well, I was going to say that, so she's got the two sisters, right? Yeah. Who are generally just bitches to her. But at one point we see them like she's been scrubbing the carpets, which I don't think you scrub, but she scrubs the carpets. And when she's almost done, the sisters come in with incredibly muddy shoes and like stomp all over it and say you missed a spot. And I think we see Cinder unlock her semblance. Yeah, I don't know if that's the first time she used it, but yeah, she superheats it and it makes a big sudy cloud. Yeah. But what also what's funny is they're like so caked in mud and they're on the second floor and they live in Atlas. <laughs> this is like what, what makes bullying so funny to me and stuff like Magical Girl Sight is because like they must have gone to so much trouble. Like I think they had to bring in a bucket of mud probably, <laughs> bring it up to the second floor, you know, like that is some dedicated bullying game. <laughs> Yeah. Uh. So stupid. But the funny thing to me about these sisters is that, okay, so this setting is like this big ritzy Atlas hotel, right? Mm. But it seems like her and the sisters are the only people that do any work here. Because it's not like her sisters don't have to work at the hotel. They also work at the hotel. But that's not like, you know, obviously they get it easier than she does. It just surprised me that for some reason they're also child labor. (laughs) To be honest, I don't recall seeing them do any work. Well, they're making that cake, which I assume is for the guests. I guess maybe not. The silly, bad-looking cake that they don't let her have any of. Yeah. And then when the hunter's like, where's my sword? It's been stolen. It's one of the sisters who has to be like, oh, I'm so sorry, sir. We don't know what's happening. Blah, 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 blah. So I'm pretty sure that they also work at the hotel. I guess. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just saying, in the same way we've been seeing a lot of think pieces about how Whitley is a victim, actually, we're going to see so many think pieces about how these girls are blameless and we're also victims <laughs> and, and how dare you talk mean about them. To be honest, I think we might not because they're girls. Oh, yeah. Th- this whole backstory has a lot of evil, abusive women and men who are much more kind and understanding going yeah. on. <laughs> yeah, it has that again. Anyway, so when, when she does do this superheated sud cloud thing, she catches the attention of a hunter who's hanging out in the place. What a good, nice hunter man. A good, nice hunter man who like... So as a good, nice hunter man, he sneaks into her room at night. <laughs> <laughs> well, she did steal his sword. <laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah, she nicked his sword. Oh, wait, wait, but before we cover that, we have to talk about when, when the evil mom abuses her, when she's zapping her, she goes, say it. And, and then Cinder's no. like, without you, I am nothing. Mm. Get it? It's an artistic parallel. That's the thing she says to Salem, even though it's funny because I doubt Salem makes her say the same thing. So I wonder if that's just something she says and Salem's like, okay, cool to know. <laughs> Slightly disturbing thing to say. Okay. <laughs> Girl, you're messed up. <laughs> 
But yeah, so she likes that sword that she saw in that hunter, so she steals it, and then he comes into her room at night, and his name is Rhodes. Very important new character. Yes. We were wondering where all the adult adult hunters are. We get to meet one. Yeah, so Rhodes is like, oh, you're being mistreated. It's so terrible. How old are you? She says 10. She does not look 10, by the way. When he said 10, we were all like, what? Because she, she looks like she's like 15 at least. Uh, 10 seems way too young to me. Ah, uh, I don't know. So yeah, it's like, you know, you're being badly treated, aren't you? And she's like, yeah. And he's like, well, that must suck. And she's like, yeah. I wrote down his lines because they annoyed the shit out of me. If you want me to go ahead and just read them off. Yeah, sure. He says, but hurting them isn't going to make your life any better. You can run, but you're going to be running for the rest of your life. Or you could find another way to handle it. It's like, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> Like, this is a hunter guy, and he's going to spend the next few years training her, and he knows that she's being physically and emotionally abused, and he's like, hey, don't try to do anything about it. Don't try to leave this abusive situation. You'll just you'll just be a coward, then you'll be on the run forever. You just gotta put up with it. It is really strange, because, like, this is the thing that, yeah, he's like, okay, if you're 10, we've got seven years to get you ready for the Huntsman, <laughs> for the Huntsman Academy. Seven fucking years. <laughs> like, he's going to come by once every few months. And give her some training. And in the, for the next seven years, she's going to be in this situation still. Like, he's not going to help her try to escape because she could run, one assumes. Yeah, and like she points out, she's like, uh, the reason she wants to be a hunter is she's like, like you, you can do whatever you want. Go wherever you want, which he can. So he could, like, obviously he could just take her with him. And then what, the cops are going to come by the Child Protective Services? And then it's like, she has a shock collar on her at literally all times. <laughs> I guess, like, we don't know how fucked those sort of things are in Atlas. I guess. There's an argument to be made that there's nothing the cops could... Not, like, they never acknowledge these things, but it really is... It's still like this dude telling her, yeah, just stay here for seven years. I'm not going to help you in any other way other than, like, in seven yeah. years. When you're free to... Like, in seven years, when you're free to do whatever you want, you can apply yeah, for the Yeah, he says then school. you won't need a guardian's permission. <laughs> it's like, you, you don't need to stay either. You can just leave. <laughs> Go do something else. You clearly don't need a guardian's permission anyways to apply for, for Hunter Academies and stuff. You got Blake and whatnot. It's not a thing. It's, this is a canonical. <laughs> so yeah, it cuts between scenes of him training her to fight and her being tortured by her mom. So she'll be like dusting badly. And then she gets the shit shocked out of her. And then, oh, yay, my nice man is back. Oh, and he's training me. Wee. Oh. <laughs> now, where things go a bit pear-shaped is... Before she's ready to leave or old enough to leave, he gives her a sword. For some reason. If I was a guy who was, let, let's, let's say I'm a guy who's like visiting a abused <laughs> teenager and training them to fight, knowing that they live with people who are abusing them on the reg. I don't know if I'd give mm -hmm. them a deadly weapon and then just leave. It's amazing. Because what happens? What happens, Cube? Well, the sisters are like, Mom, come in here. She has a weapon. And the mom's like, oh, I'm going to go zap her for being a bad girl. This will be fine. And then and then so he comes to the hotel and conveniently no one's there now. It's this weird empty hotel. And he hears her in the back room. And obviously she's killed her sisters. But there's no blood or anything, which I find really funny. <laughs> and she's in the process of strangling the mother to death as the mother is trying to shock her to make her stop. Yeah. yeah, and she says, you're right. Without you, I am nothing. But because of you, I am everything. <laughs> and then she chokes her mom to death. What does that mean? It's such an odd line. It means anime. It means that sounds like a cool anime line in my head because I'm Carrie and I both wrote and directed this episode. <laughs> so anyway. But also, so yeah, the sword has no blood on it and she doesn't use it to kill her mom even though it's in her hand. So yeah. it's like, did she just choke everyone to death after they found her with a sword? <laughs> So this man, this fucker, who is aware that she has been abused for the last seven years by these people, like tortured, underfed, overworked. Zip, 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 zip. This girl has now killed her abusers and she's looking at this guy who's been the only nice person in her life. Yeah, she smiles at him. And he's like, now I can leave. I don't have to run now. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, that's all you'll ever do. Sad, disappointed face. And he takes out his weapons. <laughs> She did the wrong thing. She's evil now. Oh, no. Fucking stupid. And, okay, so uh. before you at me, Ruby fans, you're not supposed to be in here anyway. What are you doing in here, Ruby fans? We told you not to come in here. 
people might say like he's not supposed to be like this blameless perfect figure there's no reason to think that but the framing clearly makes it seem like he's supposed to be a good influence in her life doing the right thing you know yeah. he, he wants what's best for her he's a good guy but yeah he's just like put up with all your abuse don't leave oh what you actually did something about your abuse okay i'm gonna kick the shit out of you <laughs> i'm going to like arrest you or something because yeah hunters are cops as well yeah when they feel like it i guess yeah yeah like, not just walk away, not get her help. I'm going to beat you up. <laughs> it's the first thing I'm going to do. Yeah. And I will say, kick in the good angsty butt rock. It's funny. We've gotten two good angsty butt rocks this season. Why is the opening the one that's fucking shit? I can't contribute to this debate. Yeah, I know. But it's it, it's good. It's fun. I am I enjoy it. You're so mean. You're a fucking bully. <laughs> But yeah, she, they're going to fight now. And he, it turns out that he's greed from Full Metal Alchemist because thing from the other thing. Have you heard it? Have you seen about it? It's amazing. You can turn <laughs> your skin to stone or metal or something. So Yeah, and, and he specifically does it in that way that goes up his neck but doesn't quite cover his face like greed likes to do a lot in, in FMA. And it's just like, yeah, I get it. I've seen it too. <laughs> anyway, it's a pretty short fight. Like Cinder breaks his aura real quick. <laughs> Oh, yeah, no problem. No wonder we never see adult hunters. They fucking suck. Yeah, but then he, he breaks hers, and she plays dead. And she's on the ground. And he drops his weapons to go up to comfort her, and she stabs him to death, and he's dead. Yeah, he tries to pat her head because he's such a nice guy, and then she stabs him, but then he's still able to pat her head because he's so good and nice. Yeah, and then in my favorite bit, she looks at the moon, and then she she just yanks her shock collar off. Yeah. It didn't take any effort for her to take that off. This fucking show. <laughs> Look, maybe at some point she was like, I'm just going to take it off. And he was like, no, you have to keep wearing it. <laughs> it's the only way. And I like she also cries a single tear down the middle of her eye like all Ruby characters yeah, do. Yeah, all Ruby characters have tear ducts in the middle of their eye. And also, when I think about this backstory along with Blake's backstory, it, it really feels like Ruby has this continuing theme of like, it's the coward's way out to run from an abusive situation. Yeah. No, it really that does. That was the thing that Blake dealt with that Yang called her out for, and it's the thing that this guy called Cinder out for, and it's like, what the fuck, guys? <laughs> what the fuck? It's also our two main female villains are characters who were badly mistreated and abused, and when they tried to, you know, go tit for tat on yeah. that, they're now the bad guys. Any woman who doesn't just take her abuse and put up with it is a is a piece of shit. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And yeah, of course, you know, like Cinder has been abused by a woman. Now she's going to be abused by another woman. She had a really nice guy in her life, but she killed him because she's a fucking evil woman. Whoa, 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 whoa. It's just... Guys, what did what did girls do to you? <laughs> what did they do to you? It's just... You know, I'm sure this isn't like a conscious effort on their part. No. But how do you not sort of think about the way this keeps happening? That your female characters keep falling into these weird patterns? And it's weird because, like, obviously the only point of this whole thing is to feel sorry for her. But it's also like, I mean, again, it's like the th whole thing with Salem. It's like, oh, she's so abused, but still she fucked up. Yeah, still she went too far. And now she's bad. Yeah, we can judge her for this thing she did in this awful situation she was in. <laughs> judge. Yeah, don't worry. She is a victim, but you can still judge her. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> what was the line again? To avoid being judged, she didn't tell... Ozma about how she was responsible for the world ending. Oh yeah, yeah. She she told Ozma that the gods were responsible for the death of humanity. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, <sighs> what are you doing? No, you did a bad, you did a bad job. You need to really think about these characters and what you're really saying about Woms and such, because it's pretty fucked up. <laughs> yeah, it is. Speaking of fucked up and Woms. Should we sidebar for a moment just to talk about Bumblebee? Oh, yeah. Uh, oops. <laughs> banana peels, banana peels slipping on him. Oh, God. Oh, geez. <laughs> so once again, marketing talked about Bumblebee like it was a thing and then had to be corrected because after eight seasons, Bumblebee has still not sailed. Yeah, they released a jacket that, yeah, it says, do you ship Bumblebee? And then people are like, whoa, they're acknowledging it as a ship, yay! And then they had to take out that part because people were like, oh, what? Oh, you're acknowledging that it's like possibly gay? And they were like, whoops, 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 we can't do that. <laughs> so sorry, and they took it out. And it's great because there's two other typos in that description, but they didn't fix those. They just took out the part about them being a ship. <sighs> It's just, I remember at the end of the V6 podcast, we were talking about how it seemed like 
it was running late, but they were making positive moves towards finally sailing this ship because they'd really have to since they baited it so fucking hard with that song they released. Yet we're almost at the end of season eight, and I'm still I'm not at all confident it's going to be sailed this season either. Okay, to be fair, we're halfway through season eight. Oh, but yeah, well. I see. It's funny because like I keep thinking. <sighs> It's so hard to talk about Bumblebee because it's in that weird space with Ruby where they've made it pretty damn explicit, but also now you still can never trust that they're actually going to fucking do it. No. Because, like, that conversation where Nora talks about them is very clearly saying that she thinks they're a romantic item, but, like, she's literally the only character who seems to think that. And no one else has acknowledged it. Like, if Yang has feelings for Blake, she seems to be kind of hiding it. So it's like this really weird mix of, like, it is in the show as, like, a possible thing that's going on. But you still just won't fucking do it. That's the thing to me. It's like, okay, yeah, sure, it's in the show as a possible thing. But since that song, there has been ample time to just fucking say a lot. Yeah, because the song was really like the cliff they went over to me. I don't care what they say about, oh, it's just something that Jeff liked because he wrote it. Once you release that, there's no going back. Fuck you. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing is this is like teasing it out. And there's no good reason to tease this out. You could just sail it. They could just be a couple. It wouldn't hurt. Like we've pointed out before, there was ample time if you wanted a high moment in V7 to maybe have, maybe sail Bumblebee, maybe have them kiss if you wanted a high moment, as opposed to making Ren Nora do it at a point that made no fucking sense for their arc. They went on a date together, yeah. and it's like, are we not supposed to see that as a date? Was it not a date? Like, why not make it a date? Or do you want to sail them? <laughs> just sail it. Why are they being so coy? Why is this taking so long? Because the longer it takes, we're continuing to have this sort of thing, like this thing with the jacket happen, where they're like, oh, no, we can't actually say it. What, is, what are we doing? Why can't you just do it? Yeah, I, the one thing I can really think of that's like the most generous to them is that they're from this era of thinking about LGBT relationships. I think Monty actually said something to this effect when people asked him about if there'd be any gay characters. It was like, we want to make sure we really like, they really earn it and like do it right. You know, like they feel like they have to go way further to justify a gay relationship than you would for a straight relationship. Which is weird. And so they're just like, we really got to put in the time. We got to make five C's really justifying the fact that these two girls are gonna kiss. Okay, well, I mean, even if they did think that, that's wrong, and there's plenty of people who could tell them that. Oh, no, I mean, there's no way to interpret the situation that looks good for these guys. No, it's just, they're just fucking it it's up. sad, and, and no matter how you slice it. And it's been long enough at this point, but even if it eventually does sail, this is still a disaster. This still took too long. Like, this was still just incredibly badly handled. Yeah, and it's still, like, it's been that weird combination of, like, some characters know they're obviously a thing, but then they're still not going to, and now you would separated them so that you can have a single hint at one of them kind of liking the other in a completely inappropriate situation in one episode. Yeah. Great. And it's so sad seeing people being like, yes, yes, we love it, give us nothing. Yeah, she, she mentioned that she cares about what Blake thinks about her. Mmm, that's a good shit. It's such terrible rep. Please, please go find wars. better rest. Uh, it, it sucks because these are the same sort of jokes that like ladybug shippers would make. But ladybug shippers, it makes sense for them to make these jokes because there's nothing there. Because they know. Yeah, they know there is nothing there. The two characters they ship almost never speak to each other. And it's like, I ship Checkmate, but like, it's so fucked up that my ship has gotten more play this season <laughs> than the one that's supposed to be maybe can Fucking Ladybug has gotten more play this season. Did you see that shot at the end of the last episode where Ruby was like resting on, on Blake's shoulder? <laughs> That shot's really funny, by the way, because, you know, like, Ruby's doing her, well, I'm on TV, and Blake is smiling, and Weiss is kind of looking at Blake and frowning. Like, I, I feel like she's the only one that's like, are we really happy right now? <laughs> <laughs> are we having a good time here? What's happening? <laughs> that's my girl. Uh, but yeah, fuck all that shit. It's the worst. Do it or, or admit that you're never going to do it. Otherwise, eat shit yeah, right Yeah, just away. stop teasing it. It's been, it's been too long. Just fucking yeah. silent. Stop piss fighting about Anyways, anyway. Salem wakes up from this very important flashback where we learn so much about her. What does she wake up on? <laughs> She's on a fucking bone bed in, in the whale. It's just a big old bed made out of bone. <laughs> and... I want to say real quick, like, so this whole flashback, obviously the, the main takeaway is that, like, she's been abused or whatever, but it doesn't really do anything to make her character more interesting or more complex or more sympathetic to me. No, not really. 
I could have guessed that she had some bad childhood. The fact that you made it this cartoon abuse nonsense. Who cares? <laughs> well, it's, it's the same as in all those anime when it's like, when it's this over the top. It's not relatable at all. This isn't like, this doesn't feel like anyone's actual childhood. <laughs> and I know, like... Some people will say, like, well, you're underestimating the cruelty of people. But no, it's stupid. It's too much. It's it's the wrong tone for the show. And it's the kind of thing where, like, everybody is kind of teaming together to bully her. Like, even when she gives a random guest their food in their uh, room, they'll be like, I hate you, and take the food and slam the door on her. And it's like, fucking, why are you in on this? Yeah. I'm not saying that maybe, like, maybe uh, there are people who have lived through this sort of thing. But in, like, a TV show, it's different when you add all these things in deliberately to make it as suffer as possible. Oh yeah, part of me was like the only thing that would have really made this a true edgy anime is if at some point the hunter guy like sexually assaulted her and then we'd be totally into, <laughs> we'd have hit all of the normal beats. I will say we never saw her being bullied in a bathroom so that's like one <laughs> anime checkbox we didn't get. Yeah well, clearly Curry hasn't watched enough anime. <laughs> the thing that bugs me I agree with what you say about how this doesn't really make Cinder more interesting. Like it doesn't like, the connection between this and power, even though she's not really after power anymore, she just wants to kill Ruby, is her main motivation. It's not like a clear, interesting sort of connection. There's no, you, don't, you don't learn this backstory and go, oh, this explains so much about her. Yeah, the only relevant thing is she lacked power, so now she wants power. Yeah, makes sense. Checks out. I didn't need a whole two-thirds of an episode <laughs> to understand that. Yeah, and like... She wakes up and Emerald's here being really kind to her as usual. Yeah, this is really weird because Cinder's mad that she brought her back and I don't understand that. Oh, I don't know. I, I, I didn't know how to take that either. But I'm just, this interplay she has with Emerald, which we've seen like four or five times now, this is something else that happens when, from like, I feel like a lack of coordination with the writers. We keep seeing the same beat over and over again. Like the number of times we've seen <laughs> Marrow be not sure about this with everything that the other race ops are doing in Ironwood. For as little as we've seen Emerald, I've seen enough moments of Emerald being caring and friendly with Cinder and Cinder going, fuck off. And it's also like, we've been ready for Emerald to turn since volume three. Yeah. That or just, I want to, I want these characters to change status in some way. Like, I want Cinder to either start being nicer to Emerald or something. Or like, because like, this is one of those things where, okay, yeah, she didn't have any friends. No one loves her. And here's someone who does effectively kind of love her and she's still like, Wait, is that why they had this scene right after that? Is that supposed to be, like, ironic and sad? Like, oh, she can't recognize actual love and affection when she sees it. And it's also, like, the idea that I think there's also a thing to the way that clearly Salem is abusive towards Cinder as well. You know, there's probably allusions there to the way that people who ended up in abusive relationships end up in a pattern of abusive relationships. Yeah, wait, we, we got to wait to talk about that because that's actually kind of interesting to me, that scene. Yeah, not, not so much to me. <laughs> but... I just, yeah, I'm bored. I'm bored of these same beats over and over and over again. But you know what we do get in this scene? Hey, you asked about characters changing status. Well, somebody's gotten a promotion. <laughs> and. <laughs> is Mercury. And his voice actor back. <laughs> yeah, I guess he, he came back from vacation or whatever. Mercury's allowed to talk now again. <laughs> yeah. Mercury walks in and Cinder tries to order them both around. And Mercury's like, I don't take orders from you anymore. I've got a new boss. Oh, and I do like that he's like, why do you keep protecting her? You know she doesn't care about you. And I'm like, yeah, Mercury, fucking say it out loud. <laughs> and she's not wrong. No, yeah, he's absolutely right. And it's like, I, I'm glad because, you know, I hated Mercury in, I think it's volume six, where he was, you know, doing his edgy backstory stuff, because he's another guy that was like a fun, sassy character, like Crow, who then they made like very angsty and edgy. And, uh, and I'm like, why does this keep happening? Let them be, you know, shit boys. <laughs> I like the trash boys. So hopefully you can get some of that energy back. I will say in terms of people's outfits this season, Mercury's outfit has sort of grown on me. <laughs> Yeah, Mercury's is solid. And I think part of the thing is that it's not that different from his previous outfit, right? It feels no. like it's in the same vein and is just like a bit of a... Changed some details around, made it a little more colorful, and, and that's what you need to do. Yeah, and it's also like, it feels bulkier like winter clothes. And it also just, it looks like modern fashion sort of stuff. And, and that's, it's very ruby. Yeah, yeah, I liked it. And I feel bad about the Hazel thing, because as bad as the Hazel thing looks on his actual model, the concept art, I understand why they thought it looked okay, because in the concept art, it does look much better. Mm. And it's partly because of like the way he's built in the concept art is much more of a what you would expect a big anime man to look like without the breaded muscles and stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <sighs> 
Now, speaking of Hazel. Yeah, so Mercury tells Cinder that Salem's calling them all into the office because she wants to show them something big. And then we cut to... So it turns out that that Ozpin is is a blameless boy because we were being mean to him. But it turns out that what we didn't know is that there was a whole internal debate, apparently, where Oscar chose to take the beating from Hazel. (laughs) This is this thing about this whole beating concept because it it makes some sense from... Oscar's perspective because he's he claims that he thinks that Hazel is holding back because Hazel knows to some extent that Oscar is Oscar right now but the second that he knows it's Ozpin he's looking at as in, like who's who's in control of the body he'll go harder and then later on in the scene we see that but the thing that doesn't make any sense is that like if you injure this boy Oscar's still in there he's still going to feel those injuries if your objective was you didn't really want to hurt Oscar that badly then you can never beat him up no, that's clearly not the case. By the way, Oscar is like beat up to shit. He's got a black eye. He's got all sorts of injuries. Yeah, 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 he's been yeah. kicked the fuck around. So the idea that he's like, no, I, I'm pretty sure he's going easy on me. And then Hazel keeps being like, stop making me hurt you. I I don't want to beat you, but it's because of Ozpin. Ozpin keeps making me do it because he exists inside you. I don't think he's going easy on you, Oscar. I guess the idea is he could just kill him. <laughs> like that might happen. There's no way Salem would be down with that. She wants that info. No, of course. Yeah. But you do see him, you do see Hazel get a bit angrier once he realizes he's talking to Ozpin. Oh yeah, but before he comes in, they have this conversation where Oscar is like, oh, by the way, where the fuck is his aura? Why is his aura not coming back? I hate it. I hate how fucking, it's just, you know, whatever they feel like for a scene, whether aura regenerates or not and how long it takes. And it it, it pisses me off. Look, I could buy that if you're having the shit kicked out of you, aura doesn't regenerate all that quickly. Okay, but Aura is also supposed... It doesn't seem to be healing him, which is the thing that would be taking up Aura. Well, he's be- he's just being beaten that hard <laughs> that, it, like, the second he heals, there's more punches. I don't know. I could buy that he's, like, being kept at a very low Aura position, I suppose. I don't know. Maybe. I'm fine with it. <laughs> but, so, he says... She knows that she can't take on the whole world, so she manipulates it. She sends in people and they manipulate countries from the inside. Maybe we should do the same. This is good, actually. We can use psychological tactics and and we're going to bring somebody over to our side. (laughs) Ha ha. And I I just love the way that they say it like, hey, here's an idea. (laughs) I love that Ozma and Oscar are going to try and win Hazel over by debating him in the marketplace of ideas. (laughs) Yeah, of all the people, th- this Mr. Reasonable Man Hazel. Of all the fucking people. But this is this is a sad thing. It kind of works. Because <laughs> the show is so fucking stupid. I mean, ha- Hazel comes the closest to having a rational conversation he has ever had. Yes, I'll acknowledge that. I don't know if I would say it works. <laughs> Well, the thing is, like, okay, so Hazel comes in and he's beating up Oscar and Ozpin opens his eyes. He's like, I'm going to talk to you now. And then Hazel's like, coward, you let him suffer this whole time when you could have come out. And it's like, Hazel, you can't blame Ozpin for this. (laughs) Why do you keep making me beat this child, you you horrible man? (laughs) Dude, dude. Dude. And then Ozpin's really strong debate tactics is he's like, well, fucking look at Salem. She's obviously worse than me. And Hazel's like, but Salem can't be stopped, though. <laughs> and Oz is like, Salem, she can't be stopped. But I, I think that we can stop her. And he's like, hmm. and he has a, he has a look like, I never thought about that. <laughs> I- <coughs> <coughs> the thing I love. Hazel's obviously is an insane character who doesn't make any sense. But I do love his reasoning that, well, Salem is a force of nature. She can't be stopped. So I guess I'll help her. I, I guess I'll help her, like, beat people up. I'll actively help her destroy the world. You know that phenomenon where people will kind of really shit on other people on Twitter because they're, like, really mad about other more major issues, but, like, you know you can't actually do anything about it, so you're just going <laughs> to... <laughs> bully the shit out of this one person who like drew a bad fan art or something that's hazel <laughs> hazel's like look i know i can't do anything about salem i have to take my anger out on someone so i'm canceling ozpin yeah yeah and in order to cancel ozpin i have to team up with salem <laughs> yeah because that's his argument he said he, he breaks a um a tooth off from this room a big fang yeah i don't know what he's gonna do with that yeah, I don't know. and he goes like but you, you sacrifice children to a wall you know can never be won and it's like dude but this is Why are you having Hazel try to make arguments? Yeah, and like, this is another theme that they've been kind of pushing since volume three, but it's very clear that they're never going to do with it. It's just something that they say whenever they want someone to hate Ozpin, but not in a way that they actually want to like deal with morally. (laughs) 
Because it's like, yes, we know. He makes children fight. It was in like the fucking volume two opening song. <laughs> but it, do we care? No, it doesn't fucking matter. It's just stop bringing it up if you're not going to actually like judge him for it other than having bad guys say that. Yeah. And also, like, again, when he says he has children fight Salem, <laughs> children fighting Salem is essentially people fighting Grimm. And in this world, people need to fight Grimm. This is still like, it's a thing that needs to happen. Is he actually doing anything that wrong, really? Yeah, because that's the thing. He wasn't sending children to fight Salem. And it's, it's that whole, like, Oz doesn't have a plan thing. Oz actually had a plan. That's what this show doesn't understand somehow, even though they wrote it. Oz was having hunters fight Grimm because Grimm are an immediate life or death threat to people and he was hiding the relics because it turns out that for some reason Sa he does think that Salem wants them all. That's not a non-plan, that's a plan and that's that's the thing that he was doing. And so again, it's just like the idea is that he was training these children secretly to actually fight a war and to go kill Salem? Why would you think that? <laughs> because she's a final boss. Yeah, that's, yeah. Like when they say, I don't have a plan, it was, I don't have a plan to kill the final boss. But in the meantime, this is a guy who's managed to keep the world like running. Ugh, this fucking show. Yeah, it's like as, as much as he fucking sucks, his actual plan of operations wasn't that bad. Assuming that, yeah, he just needed to keep the relics from this unkillable superwoman. Yeah. He was doing about all he could for that. <laughs> <sighs> this show's fucking nonsense. I love this show. Yeah, it's so yeah, Ozpin casually drops, he says like, but Salem, she can be fought unless she brings the relics together, if that happens. And this, this is like that moment in Black Rock Shooter, I'm like, finish that fucking sentence, Oz. <laughs> finish that fucking sentence! <laughs> if she brings the relics together, then what? What is she gonna do, Ozpin? <laughs> uh, well, later on, he says, stop helping her, she's going to kill everyone. All I can surmise from those two lines <laughs> is that Salem's plan is to bring the gods back and have them kill everyone. Again. Have them kill everyone again. Yeah. What? And why does she want to get everyone killed? What's her motivation for doing that other than being the big bad boss? <laughs> because she's evil. Yeah, that's that's it. Like, she wants to kill everyone because she's a bad guy. How does that help her with her thing? Because, like, again, during V6E3, which, as we predicted at the time, is slowly becoming sort of retconned and undone in terms of explaining anything that was happening. Her whole thing was just was that she wanted to die. <laughs> like she wanted to end her life and they wouldn't let her. And then once her and Ozpin were together, she wanted to help him out. And then also she wanted to make a new race of people that had magic. I just love the idea that these fucking basic bitches think that an interesting motivation and goal for this villain is just, oh, she wants to kill, she wants to destroy the world, she wants to kill everyone. Yeah, not for any particular reason even. She's evil. And as an audience, that's all we need. Oh, you, yeah, we don't need anything else other than that. Obviously that makes sense to us. I already told you she's evil. <sighs> And then it's like, what do her minions think is happening? Because Mercury seems to be under the impression that she wants to take over the world, which is also what the book thought. Yeah, and rule it as a dark queen. But if she gathers the relics, everyone dies. We know this. That's what That was definitely in your TV show. I mean, the only thing I can think is that maybe she doesn't know that. Because, like, that was, like, the fact that if the gods come back, if humanity is not united, they're going to destroy the world. Does she not know that that's what's going to happen if humanity is not united? He at least told her humanity had to be united because that's what she was trying to help him do. So unless Ozpin just for some reason specifically left out information that would create more drama... <laughs> He must have told her why he needed to unite everyone, I would think. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Part of me almost wishes that, like, we get to the end of this and she brings the gods back and she's like, yeah, I've taken over the world, they're all united. And they go, oh, cool, okay, we'll just stay then. And as a reward, you get to die. And everyone just sort of goes, oh, oh okay. For a while, I was wondering <laughs> if that might be her, like, secret actual goal is that she wants to, like, unite everyone against her and actually she was going to save the world because that was the only way to unite, unite humanity. I don't think that's the case, though. I think she's just evil and wants to kill everyone. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, and I realize this is another time that they've just casually dropped something that they don't seem to have realized they haven't told us yet. Yeah. Because... We were wondering why Salem knew that they were going to Atlas, and it turns out that we forgot a line in 
volume six or whatever the fuck, where for some reason Hazel knew that they had the lamp and were taking it to Atlas. Mm. So when Hazel got his ass kicked in Haven and immediately went home, somehow he got information between those two things about what Ruby was up to days later and where they were going. It makes no fucking sense. <laughs> It's so stupid. It's just so stupid. It's a really stupid show. I love the show. Anyway, but yeah. Yeah, I think we're just meant to have assumed that she's bad and she wants to destroy the world or something. Yeah, it's stupid as fuck. Anyways, Ozpin is, is using that those psychological tactics. They're working real good. But then Salem interrupts and she's like, Ozma, you have wonderful timing. The show's about to begin. And she calls everyone in, into her big office with the big TV. And she started petting Tyrion in a really weird, like, happy dog way that I don't like. <laughs> He's been a good boy. He deserves pets. This feels like a kink. Uh. Ah. But it's funny because she's like, Tyrion got a message from Watts. And I like the idea that does she not have a smartphone that Watts could contact her on? <laughs> Why can Watts only contact Tyrion? <laughs> <laughs> and she also, she calls Penny a puppet, which was on my fucking checklist. So hell yeah. Oh, yeah we'll, do, we'll do a Penny bingo update at the end of the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so she's like, so Cinder, you fucking, you turned on me again. Or, you, you know, I told you not to do that. And you did it. And so she tortures her by making her grim arm hurt. And because I know writers who use subtlety in their cowards, <laughs> it shows you a shot of Cinder as a young person being zapped by her other evil stepmother to make sure that you understand that there's a parallel here. <laughs> I hate it. Uh... So, yeah. It's like, yes, we get it. We're not that stupid. We understand what you're doing. <laughs> well, in that sense, I still, I'm not quite sure because, because what happens after she does that is she's like, you disobeyed me. And I realize it's all my fault. Here I am holding you back instead of lifting you up. You deserve so much more than I've given you. And she lifts her up and she's like, go do whatever you want. I'm your better abusive mother. I'm not as bad as the other mother. And I'm like, what is, what is the theme here? <laughs> I guess it's that, like, abusive people are willing to put up with lesser amounts of abuse for the sake of not being in the worst uh, abuse. I don't know what the theme is. <laughs> to me, it feels like she's setting Cinder up for a, a fall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it felt more like she's Cinder's going to get jobbed by Salem at some point in the, before the end of this season. She needs her maiden shit, so why would she purposefully, like, send her out on some kind of death mission or something? I don't understand. See, I was wondering, like, I was wondering if she's going to, like, come back and open the vault for her and then she's just going to fuck her off. Because, like, she doesn't actually need the full maiden powers anymore because that vault's open. Well, I mean, we don't know. She, Salem wants Cinder to have all the maiden, and we don't know if that's just because she wants access to the vaults or if there's some other reason. Because, as usual, we don't know what Salem wants or what she's doing ever. No. But... There's just something about, like, um, you know, Ruby writing is extremely basic and there's just something about what's happening that feels like this is, the Cinder is being set up to go down soon. Oh, because you refuse to watch the opening, there's something you don't know. There's part of the opening where time stops and Cinder is walking past everyone, so a lot of people think that she's going to somehow get the last use of the gin of the lamp and use it for some shit. <laughs> well, this is the other thing that could happen. This could be the beginning of Cinder redemption arc <laughs> zukoing as everyone's calling it <laughs> yeah because like you know because we've had we had the episode where we we're meant to start feeling sympathetic towards her or something and she, like salem's <laughs> gonna try to kill her and so she's gonna finally turn away from this abusive relationship and blah 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 maybe emeralds will die for her i don't know something like that but this is again it's like i was saying last week i don't get what salem's relationship with cinder is meant to be like because i don't it's just because we don't understand anything about salem yeah, this is the first time that Salem has actually, like, really been, like, directly abusive towards Cinder. And even now it's like... I mean, obviously, yes, it's an abusive relationship because she physically tortured her. But she's still, for an evil dark queen, she's still being surprisingly reasonable. <laughs> and it's interesting because, like, I guess the idea is that, like, that's her interesting way of manipulating Cinder. Because it's like, you use the, the stick and then you use the carrot or whatever. Mm. But it's still just like, because we don't know exactly what she thinks of Cinder or wants with Cinder or wants ever or anything. It's like, I don't, I don't know how to read any of this. No, uh, yeah, same. What are you doing? Yeah. And I mean, it might also just be that like, this was the bit that Cinder was supposed to go do. Because it does seem like what's triggering what's about to happen is the fact that the message got sent out. Because that, that seems like that can be the only thing that Salem was waiting for, right? 
No, I think she was waiting for her her river to get all the way to the thing. Yeah, that's also possible, I suppose. But yeah, it's like now she's letting Cinder do the exact thing that Cinder wanted to leave and do last time. So But she's just letting her have another crack. <laughs> yeah, again, she's she's very supportive of her daughter. Even though they seem to have control of the fucking the maiden now? Yeah, she said, go get Watts, and then you and Watts go get Penny. And I don't understand why that's the order of operations at all. <laughs> Ironwood definitely thought that Watts was hacking Penny such that she'd be under their control, but, but they're treating it like Penny is just was just hacked such that she shuts down. I don't know what's supposed to have happened with Penny so far. I, I, I couldn't read that scene. Anyway, look, we're, we're stalling a lot. Let's get to what actually happens at the end of this. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot faster than I was expecting, we find out what the Grim River is for, and it wasn't what I was expecting. Yeah, d I, I guess you got us? I, I don't know, because it's like, ah ha ha, Ruby is getting everyone killed, and I guess that was a subversion, but I don't know if we were supposed to think that, so <laughs> I don't know. The thing I'm not sure about is, like, I still don't know what's going on with the, if, like, this is the last we'll see of the river, but this is definitely not what I expected the river to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we're we're in the plane with Winter and the Aesop's losers, and they're talking and saying a lot of dumb stuff like, "How do we even know we can trust Watts?" And this is why I don't trust technology. Mm. And other fucking nonsense. They're so dumb. And Winter is like, "Shut up, you stupid." And then Marrow is like, "Hey, we're getting a distress call for help, and it's from Jury on their bikes." And the, 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 the distress call says a large mass of Grim is headed straight for Mantle. And I, it, this made me realize, you know, they call it a large mass of Grim. I have a feeling that the river was supposed to be. So in Kingdom Hearts 3, <laughs> <laughs> there's this like mode of Heartless that you can fight where a bunch of like the the very basic form of Heartless kind of create a big old like rivery cloud thing and come at you. Just like, you know, like a big old blob of them. You might call it a mass of them. <laughs> And I have a feeling that that's what they were imagining. <laughs> but instead, because there was no time and no budget, they showed a big gloopy blob and a single grim head. <laughs> so, the oops. Yeah, so they refer to the river as a mass. The Aesop ship comes down to where Jorn and the other two are, and Yang's like, oh, it's you. Yeah, and somehow the Aesops haven't seen any of this. They haven't noticed any of this giant crack and giant river. They're right next to it. From they the are sky. hovering right above the crack. And the first thing they say to the fucking team jury is, Where's Penny? Yeah, we we have a job that we signed up for Gotem. <laughs> It's just stupid. It's so stupid and cartoonish. Yeah, it's just like, you want to tell them, like, just look to your left. And they'd be like, no, you won't get me like that. I'm not going to look to my left. Mm. <laughs> dumb it's dumb but anyway john says what are you doing this is an emergency we're about to and then the river <laughs> i wasn't expecting this I'll admit. no the the river gets underneath atlas and fires a bolt of goop at a shield on the underside of atlas is that what happened yeah it geysered yeah it geysers into this shield and takes the shield out uh-huh one little chunk of the shield goes down yeah, it's because it geysers and then it leaves behind a big blob with a bunch of of the uh, wormy boys. And the wormy boys kind of burrow through and they take the shields out by tipping over a couple of the shield towers and s s got them. When we say a couple of the wormy boys, let's be clear, three. Three wormy boys. Look, I saw four of them in one shot, okay? There's at least four wormy boys total. Okay, four wormy boys get into the rock in Atlas. Who would win the most powerful nation in Remnant or four wormy boys? <laughs> we see one ship. We finally see a ship from the fleet. Shoot once, takes out one wormy boy. The other two get into the dirt and they knock down two shield pylons. Shields down. Atlas is done. There go the shields. That was it. <laughs> That's all it took. And what's amazing is in another shot after this, we see the fleet, or at least like 10 of these warships, we just see them hovering in the background. <laughs> so they are fine, and they are there, and they're just chilling. Yeah, they're just hovering. They're just not doing it. Like they always do, because they're fucking matte paintings in the background, and they can't move. And what's great is that there's this, they see all this happening on TV in Atlas, like they've been surveying the situation. How did they not notice the giant Grim River? <laughs> And yeah, so and so, Cinder says it's time, and the Grim lands on Atlas. The whale. Let's be clear, we're talking about the giant Grim whale. Yeah, the Grim whale lands on Atlas and pukes a bunch of goop, and then a bunch of Grim come out of it, and that's the end of the episode. 
It's amazing. And also, uh, <sighs> n- getting near the end, you can definitely see how they were running out of time and money because they land on the part of Atlas that is like farmland and apparently grows all crops for all of Atlas and Mantle. <laughs> and the farmland is just like this JPEG square, but like copied all over. And it's just like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's rough. And yeah, we're, we're here on the whale. Um, woo, so volume three, right? We're doing it. <laughs> but more. I I just, fuck. Like, volume three, but more. Three wormy boys. And there was one ship in the fleet that did a laser. And that was it. This powerful ancient witch who has all magic. This is her big plan is to sneak three wormy boys up there. <laughs> And also that, like, that was the, the river geysers. Like, that's what that's what does it. Like, the only thing stopping them getting in was the shields. The whale couldn't have, like, knocked them down. It couldn't geyser, I guess. Yeah, and it's like, we don't actually see where this river of Grimm came from, even. It's like, was the whale just... People were joking that it was, like, peeing or pooping it out. Because, <laughs> I mean, apparently it can puke and then a bunch of Grimm come out of it. So was it just, like, puking off screen all, all the time? Just be like... <laughs> My assumption is that in their minds, this was a giant, massive centipede grim, and it was going to like burrow all through Atlas, and there was just going to be so many of them, and it was going to be like, whoa, that's some crazy ass shit. We can totally understand how that took it over. But, you know, you ran out of time and money, so you only you only had budget for three Wormy Boys. Three Wormy Boys in one ship, and that was the Battle of Atlas. Hope you enjoyed it. There you go. Yeah, it is amazing that the ships have just been sitting there this entire time. The Whale Grim was right there. Yeah, not shooting at the Whale Grim. It doesn't seem like anyone has even tried to shoot at the Whale Grim. Or maybe they did and they got shot down. We don't know because they never show us. Yeah. If they made any attempt to do anything against Salem, it was all off screen. Oh, this fucking show. I love this show. So, yeah, that was that was this episode. The, the, a, a magical girl sight level backstory for Cinder. Some more of the same. And then a river goes... And three wormy boys. The fucking shock collar. <laughs> oh, I also love... There's a no fauna sign oh, on yeah. the counter at the hotel. I like that it's on the counter and not on the outside window. You can come in and hang out in the lobby, but you can't get a room there. <laughs> And it's also like, it's, it's a good reminder of if you wanted some kind of, you know, abused slave labor in Atlas, why would you go all da- the way down to Mistral and get a fake daughter? Why wouldn't you just get one of these faunas who are apparently living in the ghettos and shit? <laughs> it's much more convenient. It's again, this thing of racism is when you see someone being overtly racist, not sort of, you know, smaller systemic shit. That no faunas sign was, this was only like... Well, I guess we don't know how the fuck old Cinder is, goddammit. But it wasn't that long ago. I still don't know. I want to know about what the, the status is of Faunus and Atlas because the main characters don't give a fuck even though it seems like they're in a really, really bad place societally. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Fucking stupid show. I never not clean amazed. Clean the floors and <laughs> clean the That song the is so things. bad. Do the chores and cry some tears. Uh, be abused and sad and motivated for power. And now whenever I hear her light motif, I have to think of this instead. Uh. I like that one of them is scrub my feet. <laughs> is the next episode the last one before the break? Yes. Okay, that'll be interesting. So I guess we'll get an idea of, hopefully we find out what if we're going to get some evil red eye penny fight stuff. We'll see if... What the fuck? So Ruby's on Atlas, so they can easily participate in whatever the fuck's going on, I guess. Jury's gonna have to get up there somehow. Oh, we did see a bunch of Grimm wandering around the city. This time, where were they at when they were... When they went all the people? <laughs> yeah, they were just like... And they look up when stuff starts happening. Like They're like, oh, this is concerning. <laughs> oh, we were getting bored. <laughs> This fucking show. All right. Uh, I guess we'll see you guys next week for the break. No, wait. Nope, nope, nope. We got to check out um, Penny Bingo. Oh, yes. No, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, Penny Bingo. Yeah, we, we didn't do it last time, and I realized that there are a few things that I can check off now. So someone calls Penny a puppet or a doll or some shit, so Salem finally used the word puppet, so thank you for that. We've got Maiden versus Maiden Sky Fight, which we got last episode. We've got Holds Up Falling Atlas. I'm giving myself half points for that, since it was a whole big thing of her holding up Falling Amity Tower. A, a bit less big, but still the same basic imagery. Mm-hmm. 
I had that time period killed her comes up, which I'm also giving myself half points for because I feel like the spear, there's a really good chance that that was a purposeful allusion to that. Mm, I, I would agree. Yeah, so I think that's the only thing we have so far, but like all of these things are still very much in play, like Pietro dies. Oh, yeah. She tells Winter how disappointed she is in her. <laughs> these are all, there's so solid chances for these. <laughs> I think the chance of a blackout is still very much on the cards. <laughs> Because you, ha you have bingo right now, right? Yeah, yeah, because since she did get hacked, I have bingo across the middle. And I'll have another bingo if there's a weird comparison between her and Ironwood based on their metal parts. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I'll get a blackout just because one of my things was free a funeral. And I don't think anyone cares about Freya no, enough no. to do anything about her. So sorry, Freya. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's all pretty good shit. I love, like, this episode, I couldn't get mad at it, unlike other episodes or whatnot. It was just so funny and so stupid and edgy, and I was just like, LOL. <laughs> it really was some fucking serious edgelord shit. <sighs> it, it's good. So I guess we finally know what Cinder's deal is. Are we satisfied? I ain't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's just, it's not interesting. Yeah, it means nothing. Yeah. It means nothing for, like, my understanding of Cinder or whatever. She had a bad childhood. Okay, good to know. Don't care. <laughs> and we're also, we're going to put up a poll for... We're going to go back to doing those anime tasters. I think there's enough anime again. You know, Corona, I think they're kind of trying to get their production together. Do your best anime, people. <laughs> and so we're going to put a poll up for which new anime you want us to watch. There isn't a whole lot, but there is some. <laughs> We're going to do a little short list for each of us, and you can you can vote for what we end up watching. We'll include the isekais. Don't worry. You get to vote on whether or not <laughs> I watch another fucking isekai. So. And there's one you can't stop me from watching because it, it's like Mecha Magookas. And I mean, obviously, I have to watch that. There's no choice. Yeah, of course. Of course. And also, there's a very Ruby-esque thing coming out. Uh, Armex, is it? Or? Oh, fuck yeah. We're both watching that. Make no mistake. <laughs> I will force Phoenix to watch it if needed. Because <laughs> it looks like Ruby, but even worse, and I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, another, another Crunchyroll produced anime. They're not, they're not, they're not kicking it out of the park so far. <sighs> Look, guys, if you want to start doing some American web comic properties, I mean, I might have an idea of this, <laughs> something that you could try to adapt. To the, just call me. Do you really want them to do it? It'd be like in weird 3D and probably horny. Look, if it wasn't the weird 3D, like the one that was done by Studio Mappa looked okay. And even the Tower of God one, like it didn't look great, but I would still be excited to see my stuff at that level of animation. Oh, <laughs> I, I'd settle. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. We'll see you guys next week. All right. Have a good week, everybody. Happily never ever after again. <laughs> <laughs>